Hello, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's First Wednesday Speaker Series, an event we host the first Wednesday of every month, usually at the Mill Valley Public Library, but for now, because of the pandemic, safely online. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the Board of Directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the First Wednesday Speaker Series and Oral History Program. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome author, historian, outdoor enthusiast, and trail builder, Brian Crawford. But before we begin, I want to say to all of you out there who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your support. And to those of you who are not, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future presentations such as tonight's. You will also receive Chuck Oldenburg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email. You'll be updated on other historical events in our town and, and nearby. And membership to the Mill Valley Historical Society is so affordable and just a click away on our Mill Valley Historical Society website. Also, I'd like to give special thanks to the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing the Historical Society to continue our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. Tonight's talk will last about an hour and then we'll take some time for questions and comments from the audience. With us tonight is our much loved Mill Valley Histor History Librarian, Natalie Snoyman. Natalie's responsible for making us look like we know what we're doing in this webinar format. Natalie, as always, thank you for your help. For those unfamiliar with Zoom meetings and webinars, here's a brief tutorial on how things work. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during tonight's event. Next is the Q&A option. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation or anything else related to tonight's talk. And I'll address those questions to Brian after his talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. There are other Zoom options to explore on your own, but they're not pertinent to tonight's event, so we'll move along. Brian K. Crawford is an author, historian, and open space activist living in Marin County with his wife, Linda, and his son, Nathan. Born in Ohio in 1947, Brian attended Ohio State and Antioch College, but dropped out and went to Haight-Ashbury for the Summer of Love. He has published three novels set in the South Pacific, the Confederacy, and Middle Earth, three collections of short stories, three memoirs of his adventures, which are amazing, and a special collection of Marin-based history books, such as Shipwrecks of Marin, the Bellinus Fairfax Road, the history of one of Marin's most scenic roads, the short Mariner family, a pioneer family who moved to San Rafael in 1845, wreck of the steamship Pacific, history of Marin County, Marin's old days, and reminiscences of Charles Lauf, an er another early Marin pioneer. Tonight will be Brian's third appearance with the Mill Valley Historical Society, and we are delighted to have him back. In July of 2019, Brian talked about shipwrecks in Marin, and it was a riveting and deeply moving presentation. It was then that I learned about his trail building efforts. Brian was kind enough to take me on a tour of his Red Hill Trail and Memorial Ridge Trail, which are so very impressive with their flow over hill and dale, their stunning views, and an infusion of history that includes historical signage at points of interest. We met again to do a little weed whacking on one of the trails. The weed whacker didn't last long, and we really hadn't made much of a dent. So much work, so much brush, and so many trees. How did he do it? How did he carve out those trails? I asked him, 
how does one begin such an undertaking? And Brian said, it begins on your stomach, on the ground, in the brush, with your face in the dirt and a machete in your hand. It was then that I asked him, would he write a talk about the history of hiking trails in Marin County and the amazing people who dedicated themselves to such an arduous undertaking? And so here we are. Friends and nature lovers, thank you for joining us and please give a warm welcome to Brian Crawford. Brian? Hi there. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I'm going to be showing a uh, PowerPoint presentation with uh, slides and it has some videos in it, um, which look absolutely lovely on a screen on a projector. I do understand that they sometimes glitch and lag a bit over Zoom, I'm afraid. So um, we'll just have to put up with that. Um, so uh, let me begin then by uh, sharing the screen with you. Okay. So our favorite trails, it might be the Cataract Trail, climbing beside the magnificent waterfalls and the spring rain runoff. It might be the Hukuiku, winding along the southern slopes of Tamalpais. Or the Collier Trail, climbing to the secret shaded glen of Collier Spring. Personally, I love the Coastal Trail, winding in and out of the ravines above Stinson Beach. There are approximately 750 miles of trails in this county. Each offers a different perspective on the beautiful place in which we live, from sunny ridges to shady silent redwood groves to windy frog shrouded beaches. These trails give us access to hilltops, offering gorgeous views, secluded waterfalls, and dark and shady canyons. In many of these places, we can count on still count on being the only person there, offering priceless opportunities for meditation and reflection. For many of us who love the outdoors, Marin trails are one of the greatest joys of living here. But as we walk along our favorite trails, how often do we stop and think, why is this trail here? Who built it? When? Why? Were they employees of the government or some company or just a lover of hiking who wanted to create a new route? How did they go about it? What problems did they face? Just how does a trail get built? This is what I want to tell you about. I'll take it in two parts. A brief overview of how some of the popular trails on Mount Tamalpais were created. And then my own experience in building several new trails in San Anselmo. Let's start with the oldest trail I know of. This is a detail from County Surveyor Hiram Austin's excellent 1873 map of Marin. On it, he marked the old San Rafael Trail. It was built in ancient times by the Coast Miwok, and it ran from the village of Awani Wi below the year round spring on San Rafael Hill over the Bolinas Ridge to the village of Baolintin on Bolinas Bay. It is shown on the earliest maps of Marin and led across the lands that are now the Marin Municipal Watershed District watershed and crossed Bolinas Ridge to the east of the Bolinas Fairfax Road. Nothing now remains of this trail. Another early Miwok trail ran from San Rafael to Olema Loque or Olima. This trail was expanded and improved by the early Mexican colonists. And in 1873, its route was followed by the North Pacific Coast Railroad and later by Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Other Miwok trading trails no doubt connected all their various villages, but all have long since been buried under roads. The only other trail shown on Austin's map in Southern Marin is an unnamed trail running from the site of the future Lake Lagunitas up to the west peak of Tamalpais and then on to East Peak. Since this trail doesn't appear on a map from 1860, it may have been built between 1860 and 1873. This is the route taken by William Brewer of the California Geological Survey in 1862. Since the Miwok considered the mountain sacred and rarely if ever visited the peak, this may have been the first ascent of the mountain. Although Jacob Lease claimed that he and Chief Marin climbed it around 1830. This trail was supposedly built by white settlers simply for hiking to the summit. If so, this is probably the oldest true hiking trail in Marin. 
Since much of the terrain is steep chaparral, it is most likely that the first users simply followed an existing animal trail. If so, the original builder of this first trail was most likely a bear. Little sign remains of it now. Hunting was very popular in the old days and a number of informal hunting camps were established at Tucker's Camp, Rifle Camp, and many other sites, each served by a trail cut by the hunters. At this time, the northern part of the mountain was owned by the Marin Water Company, the predecessor to the Marin Municipal Water District. They built roads to their reservoirs as they were constructed. Lagunitas in 1873, Bill Williams Gulch in 1886, and Swede George Gulch in 1888. In 1878, a stagecoach road was built from San Rafael to Bolinas. There's actually a fascinating book about this available on Amazon and at better local bookstores. In 1884, it was extended to Fairfax, becoming our beloved Bolinas Fairfax Road. Networks of trails spread across the hills from these new roads. The western third of the county from Alpine to the tip of Point Reyes was owned by the Shafter Howard family. The southern side of the mountain was held by a number of individual property owners and used for logging and dairy pastures. Much of the summit area and Muir Woods was owned by Congressman William Kent. Kent built a hunting cabin on the shores of the Lagunitas, now Alpine Lake, and constructed the Kent Trail to access it from his home in Kentfield. In 1884, a San Francisco auctioneer named John Eldridge thought that the county would benefit from having a road to the summit of the mountain. He began soliciting donations and soon had enough to build the road. To design it, he hired Hiram Austin, the county surveyor who had laid out the San Rafael de Bolinas Road. Austin laid out the Eldridge grade to climb the north slope from Fish Gulch to Middle Peak. The road, like the Bolinas Fairfax Road, was built by Chinese laborers and it was completed on December 13th, 1884. Soon riders and drivers were enjoying easy access to the summit. People raved about the scenic views. Unfortunately, Eldridge died just two months after it was finished. In 1896, Eldridge's son-in-law, Sidney B. Cushing, built his Mill Valley and Mount Tamalpais, Tamalpais Scenic Railway up the south side of the mountain to a tavern he built on East Peak. The railroad also built West Point Inn and a stagecoach road connecting it to Stinson Beach. The railroad was extremely popular and the number of visitors to the mountain increased dramatically. In 1907, they added an extension to Muir Woods and established another inn there. Millions of people were introduced to the beauties of the mountain and hikers filled its trails every weekend. Numerous hiking clubs were formed, including the Sierra Club, the Alpine Club, the Cross Country Boys Club, the Down and Outers, and others. Bicycling was also popular, and people rode to the summit of the mountain even before a road existed. More trails began to appear all over Tamalpais, many built by individual enthusiasts or hiking groups, with or without the permission of the property owners. As hiking on the mountain became more popular, newspaper art articles began to appear about picnickers leaving their trash on the trails and along the creeks. Others complained about the large quantities of flowers, ferns, and berries being picked and hauled away. Some areas were nearly denuded of toyon trees because the branches with their red berries were favorite Christmas decorations. One day in 1912, two veteran hikers, Samuel M. Houghton and Richard O'Rourke, were hiking with a few friends from West Point Inn to Rock Spring when they encountered a group of hunters dressing a young deer they had just shot. The hikers remonstrated with the hunters for shooting a deer when they should be enjoying the sublime beauties of the mountain. The hunters were arrogant and offensive, saying that they had every right to shoot as many deer as they liked. Through the rest of the hike, the indignant Houghton and O'Rourke talked about the incident and they agreed that the entire mountain should be a game preserve, or better yet, a park they decided to work toward that goal. On Sunday, February 18th, 1912, a rally was called at the Temple Pius Center in Kentfield. That's now the site of today's College of Marin Gymnasium to discuss the options for protecting the mountain. More than 200 men and women attended and formed the Temple Pius Conservation Club devoted exclusively to protecting and maintaining Mount Temple Pius and its trails. The club is still active more than a century later. Less than a month after it was formed, the new club organized a massive cleanup day. Teams of hundreds of volunteers set out from Mill Valley, Kentfield, and Fairfax, 
collecting trash and clearing brush from the trails. The TCC held its first annual meeting on May 4th, 1912 at Rock Spring. Members hiked from Mill Valley or from Fairfax to attend. Some took the train to West Point and walked to Rock Spring from there. Over 750 people attended the meeting. The speaker was TCC Honorary Vice President Gifford Pinchot, Chief of the U.S. Forest Service, a famous conservationist and later governor of Pennsylvania. Before the year was out, the TCC had over a thousand members, each paying $1 a year in dues. The club members built a cabin near Rattlesnake Camp that's since been renamed Van Wick Meadow. When they had accumulated $500, they hired a man to work year round to maintain the trails, remove and dispose of rubbish, install signs and build new trails. The man they hired was Anton Manabusen, a native of Guam. Anton and his wife moved into the cabin and over the next years, Manabusen built many trails and improvements, including a trail from Rattlesnake Camp to the Dipsy Trail, now known as the TCC Trail. Manabusen was called an ideal trail builder. After he left, other trail builders were hired to live in the cabin and maintain trails. The TCC adopted West Point Inn as their headquarters. Many men built trails on the mountain on a volunteer basis. Some were businessmen who worked only on weekends, often for years. Many were not young men. Alfred Wheeler was an 80 year old San Francisco attorney and dedicated trail builder. He wrote, man labors from necessity, not from mere love of work but to urge him to stop and enjoy himself is like advising the man upon the treadmill that too much exercise is not helpful. Still, seeing a need for a trail to go around the east face of the mountain and connect the northern and southern networks of trails, he built the, he spent two years working alone to build the Wheeler Trail 4,000 feet from the Ross Valley to the Hukuiku Trail. In 1881, he suffered a stroke while working on his trail. He died in 1903. Today, only the portion from Eldridge Grade to Hukuiku retains his name. John Monroe Collier was a vice president of the Cross Country Club and a charter member of the TCC. His friend Harold French said of him, he was a Scot, an old bachelor and a man of wealth he endeavored to conceal. He would come to the door and pretend he was an old tramp seeking a handout. Collier was building bridges by himself when he was more than 70. Not all trail builders were men. In 1916, Robert and Nora Stanton were hired to operate the West Point Inn and ran it for two years. At that time, there was no direct access to West Point from below. While running the inn, the Stantons spent their free time with friends building a new trail down to Mountain Home. The trail was named for Nora. They were very well liked and greatly missed when they left in 19 to go run an inn on the Feather River. Mortimer Matt Davis, a retired upholsterer from San Francisco, lived for 25 years in a cabin on the mountain and built trails in his spare time. In 1929, he built the six mile trail from Mountain Home to Pantol, improving and appropriating part of the Nora Trail. He was called the Dean of Trail Workers, the old man of the mountain and a champion trail builder. At age 64, he suffered a heart attack on the train in 1938 and died on the Golden Gate Bridge on his way to the hospital. A similar fate befell Michael Francis Mickey O'Brien. He was a charter member of the TCC and president in 1925 and 26. He worked on the trails for many years. In 1947, at age 69, he was working on the Hukuiku Trail when he suffered a heart attack. He died at Alpine Lodge on Panoramic Highway. The Barth's Creek Trail was renamed in his honor in 1948. TCC founder and president Dad O'Rourke built stonework around several of the mountain springs and cut a number of trails himself. In 1927, his friends built a bench to honor him. The plaque says, give me these hills and the friends I love. I ask no other heaven. To our Dad O'Rourke, in joyous celebration of his 76th birthday, February 25th, 1927, from the friends to whom he showed this heaven. Other TCC presidents were just as actively involved. Harry Allen, who was president in 1917 said, 
When I'm at work on a trail, planting low grades, smoothing the rough places, bridging the defiles, I feel twice blessed. The joy of the job is exceeded by the vision that it will all still be mine to use and enjoy when I am 60 or 70 or even beyond. From 1923 to 1925, he and his friends built a trail from his home in Larkspur all the way to Phoenix Lake. Only a portion of, these tr of this trail remain. The TCC contributed materially, contributed materially to the construction of the beautiful Hukuiku Trail from Kentfield up to the Double Bowknot and built numerous other trails. The new trails and the easy access by the railroad brought more hikers to the mountain every year. World War I and women's suffrage were starting the liberation of women, and a greater percentage of hikers were now women. Not everyone was happy about it. One stranger was disturbed by, quote, the costumes which young women hikers wore and the hilarious conduct of certain young men and maidens, which he observed. He advocated the employment of chaperones to patrol the trails for the purpose of protecting young men from women who wore knickerbockers. The TCC continued their annual meetings at Rock Spring. In 1919, the speaker was H.C. Simons, president of the new Marin Municipal Water District. The TCC magazine reported, Mr. Simons, with much earnestness, drew a distinction between hikers and picnickers. The former were classed as law-abiding people of dignity and character, while to the latter belong a proportion who are guilty of serious depredations, which culminate frequently in positive immorality. Citizens of Mill Valley have suffered so much from the lawless class that they are organizing to have the depredators repressed and prosecuted if need be. By 1921, the old Eldridge grade had fallen into disrepair and vehicles could no longer reach the top of the mountain. The Chambers of Commerce in San Rafael and San Anselmo began urging the construction of a new road from Summit, the high point on the Bolinas Fairfax Road to East Peak along the top of Bolinas Ridge. The TCC strongly opposed the project, saying it would desecrate some of the loveliest sections of the mountain. But Ridgecrest Boulevard was built over their complaints, and in 1924, the new toll road was opened. Automobiles now flooded to the mountain. Within five years, the railroad ridership had plummeted, and when a forest fire destroyed the tavern in 1929, the railroad closed and the tracks were pulled up. In 1933, again over the objections of the TCC, Panoramic Highway was built from Mill Valley to Stinson Beach and connected to Ridgecrest, giving much faster access to the mountain. Four years later, in 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge was opened, vastly increasing the number of automobiles coming up the mountain. During World War II, the top of the mountain and Alpine Dam were taken over by the military, and the mountain was closed to the public. It wasn't until 1948, three years after the war, that it was reopened and the toll booths were removed from Ridgecrest and Pantol. In 1963, the top of the mountain became Mount Tamalpais State Park, more than 50 years since it was first proposed by the TCC. One very active trail builder from the 20th century was Jim Vitek, or Old V as he was known. He was born in 1926 and served in the Navy in World War II. He worked in the engineering department of MMWD for 34 years. He was an avid hiker and frequently had long, strenuous hikes for the Sierra Club, Alpine Club, and the Mount Tamalpais Interpretive Association. The project he was most proud of was the trail he built from near the site of Senator Kent's cabin on Alpine Lake to the Cataract Trail above Alpine Dam. It was two-thirds of a mile long and required building a number of bridges. When it was completed in 1950, Frank Marked, who with his wife Helen had been toll takers on Ridgecrest Boulevard, had just lost his wife, and VTEC's trail was named the Helen Marked Trail to remember her. In fairness, it should have been called the VTEC Trail. VTEC is memorialized now only by the steep road from Oat Hill to Kent Lake, which was named the Old V Trail in his, in his honor. But VTEC was not pleased with the name, for he hated the road and thought it had been badly built. He died in 2007. So that's a very high level story of how some of the trails came to be on Mount Tamalpais. Few new trails are made in the park these days, but some are still being built elsewhere. I thought you might like to hear how a trail gets built in the 21st century. I was intimately involved in building two new trails in San Anselmo, and I learned a lot about how trails are built today. 
It's not like it was in the 19th century when you could just go out on a Saturday with your pick and shovel over your shoulder and start cutting a trail. I found that out in 1990 when I opened up a new trail in C. Frederick Foday Park across from my house, a trail I rather modestly call the Crawford Trail. But when it was nearly complete, a neighbor reported me and I was busted by the San Anselmo Department of Public Works. But I enjoyed the work and the trail is still there and it gets a lot of regular use. So I thought I might give up my life of crime and try to build some legal trails. I formed a group of neighbors called Friends of Fode and coordinated with the Department of Public Works to improve the trail and maintain the park. We built connecting trails and steps and fences to control erosion. We have patrols to maintain the trails and pick up trash. Renee Voss and I built a bench and installed a picnic table for the top of the hill. We built bridges over the ditches and put up signs. In, 19, in 2002, I found myself chairman of Sorich Park Area Residents, a community group in my neighborhood in San Anselmo that for 30 years had fought against the development of a prominent privately owned hillside adjacent to Sorich Ranch Park that was always referred to in legal documents as the subject property. The original proposal was for 65 condominiums, later reduced to 12 large mansions. We were trying to buy the land to give it to the town as an expansion of Sora Tranch Park. In a meeting with the neighbors, someone asked what our plans were for the land if it indeed became part of the park. In fact, we hadn't given it a thought. Our concern was to protect the land, but it was a valid question. How could this new area be integrated into the existing park? There's an old ranch road that runs up the hill to Mount Tamalpais Cemetery in San Rafael. I wondered if a trail could be built so people could walk from the park and up this road to the top of the ridge. And then what? I was tasked with coming up with a proposal. With the owner's permission, I walked up the ranch road to the ridge. I found a track running along the ridge line to the south. I had to climb a fence, so I supposed I was on someone else's property, but I was curious as to where the road led. It climbed to a beautiful hilltop with a glorious view of San Anselmo, where the towers of the San Francisco Seminary were framed against the green slopes of Mount Tamalpais. The meadow was a riot of wildflowers, poppies and lupins and dozens of species I didn't know. It really was an astonishingly beautiful place. But the dirt track ended here and there was no easy way to continue from this point. Determined to see where the ridge came out, I slipped and slid down a very steep grassy slope to another saddle, then fought and crawled through 200 yards of old growth scotch and French broom. I emerged scratched and bloody in a lovely open, open oak and bay forest. Ten minutes later, I slithered down a steep muddy slope and emerged in Memorial Park covered in dirt and blood with leaves and twigs tangled in my hair. Parents took one look at me and hurried their children away. Wow, I thought, what a beautiful place for a trail. People could walk between San Anselmo's two largest parks, all in the woods and away from any roads or houses with gorgeous views almost all the way. But it was a daunting prospect. Even if we did succeed in buying the disputed parcel and I could somehow get permission from all the landowners and the town and the neighbors, it would be a huge amount of work to build. Those steep stretches would require the installation of many steps. It would take a small army just to cut through all the broom. It would take hundreds of man hours and not a little money. The battle to save that hillside next to the park devolved into almost 20 years of legal wrangling, lawsuits and hearings. The owner swore no trail would ever be built across his land and sued the town for even suggesting it. The idea of a trail between the parks appeared to be doomed. In May of 2003, I applied to join the San Anselmo Open Space Committee, which advises the town council on open space issues. I learned that they had gotten some open space objectives written right into the town's general plan, essentially its constitution. When I examined the plan, I was surprised to find that it suggested a trail similar to the one I had proposed. So the town had already approved the trail in concept. The map also showed a potential trail going through Mount Tamalpais Cemetery. I thought it might be possible to run a new trail through the cemetery, avoiding the subject property entirely. In July, 2003, I proposed the project to the Open Space Committee. 
I called it the Sunny Hills Ridge Trail after Sunny Hills Children's Services, which owned most of the land. They liked the idea and asked me to put together a feasibility study. I talked with the management of Sunny Hills. They were amenable to granting trail easements and through their property, but they didn't want the trail to be named the Sunny Hills Ridge Trail, as it might imply that hikers could use it to access their campus. So I renamed it to the Memorial Ridge Trail, since the ridge connects to Memorial Park. Negotiations with the cemetery were more difficult, but after a decade of meetings and proposals, they agreed on an easement. Since it was outside the town limits, the easement was granted to Marin County. With permission from Sunny Hills, I began cutting a preliminary trail to make the route accessible. This involved many months of pulling broom. Once the trail could be walked, I used my GPS and plotted it out on Google Earth. It would be 1.2 miles long with 100, 400 feet of elevation gain. Over the next few years, as I widened and improved the preliminary trail, I negotiated with property owners over signage, permissions, and the locations of the easements. I hauled out trash and tried to keep the trail open for access as the broom grew back each spring. I went to the town's planning department to see what would be involved in such a project. They said we would have to do a formal environmental impact study and present the idea to the neighborhood in a series of public meetings. I'd also have to consult with public works regarding construction costs and liability insurance. This would be expensive and time consuming. A few days after this meeting, I got a call from Gerhard Epke from Public Works. He opened the conversation by saying, I hear from planning that you want to build a trail up Red Hill. I said, no, no, not Red Hill. I want to build a trail on the ridge behind Red Hill Shopping Center. But a trail up Red Hill, what a wonderful idea. Red Hill is the steep conical hill just north of the hub in San Anselmo, a landmark so prominent that it has been a major property corner since Mexican times. I had been there many times and loved the view of San Anselmo from the summit. An old road winds across the upper slopes, but the bottom was covered by impenetrable thickets of broom and poison oak, and it was a difficult and strenuous climb to get to the top. It was a bushwhacker's paradise, but I was excited at the idea of making the summit accessible to more sensible hikers, so the project became the construction of not one, but two trails. Gerhard and I walked the routes of both proposed trails. He thought the project was possible, but it would require some engineering to reinforce one dangerous spot. Like the first trail, it would have to have an environmental impact report and public meetings with the neighbors. Working now with the town's Department of Public Works, we removed many abandoned homeless camps from both trail locations. When we cleared out the broom, acacia, and blackberries at the base of Red Hill, we found an entire house surrounded by a sea of trash. The town demolished it and hauled it all away. One of the camps had a propane stove set up in the dry broom, and it started a fire that burned the south side of Red Hill. The fire department lowered a crew onto the summit by helicopter, and they used my preliminary trail as a fire break. The land with the old road was already owned by the town, but the landslide area at the bottom was not suitable for building a trail. The trail would have to detour through the next parcel to the north. It turned out the land was owned by Sunny Hills, who also owned Memorial Ridge. I called Karen Bischoff, their director of property. I told her about my idea and asked if Sunny Hills would consider granting a trail easement across their land. She immediately replied, oh, why don't we just give you the land? I couldn't believe how easy that had been. I brought my findings to the Open Space Committee in August 2013, and they approved the project to be called the San Anselmo Trails Project. I was directed to put together a proposal to convince the town council to approve the project and commit resources to it. The problem was that no trails existed where I wanted to build them. Only crazed bushwhackers like me ever went to those places. It was hard to describe what I was talking about, and I sure couldn't drag the mayor and the town council up through all that poison oak to show them. I decided that the only way to really get people to understand the roots was from the air. With a small grant from the Open Space Committee, I hired father and son videographers and drone operators, Brian and Bill Sigar in Fairfax, to shoot some footage of me walking the two routes. So we met up one Saturday in February 2016, and I walked the trail <clears throat> while Bill flew the drone overhead. Brian walked behind me with a GoPro on a selfie stick 
with a steady cam so it didn't bounce as he walked. I edited the raw footage into an eight minute documentary, adding music and graphics. The Open Space Committee showed it at street fairs and at public meetings. Here's just two brief excerpts from it. In September 2013, the Open Space Committee presented the project and video to the San Anselmo Town Council, and they approved a feasibility study. The committee committed $54,000 of its allocation from Measure A, the county sales tax measure for parks and open space. I was appointed chairman of a trail subcommittee to pursue the project. I led groups of interested citizens to show them the site. We hired surveyor Bill Schroeder to stake out the trail easements and draw a map. On Memorial Ridge, he laid out a 50 foot wide easement along the existing dirt road on the ridge top and a 100 foot wide easement where no trail existed to give us room to put in switchbacks. The town hired Garcia and Associates to do an environmental impact study or EIS. Depending on their findings, we might have to do a considerably more detailed and expensive environmental impact review or EIR. They employed geologists and soils engineers to ensure that the new trails would not create or exacerbate any landslides and botanists and biologists to see if we would disturb any endangered or threatened species. They evaluated the visual impact of the trails. They contacted archeologists and the Miwok Indians to confirm that we were not impacting any historical or sacred sites. They specified certain months of the year during which we could not work to avoid nesting birds and bats. It was exhaustive and expensive, but generally they had no issues with the routes or the project. Since the Memorial Ridge Trail was still mired in red tape, we decided to begin construction with the Red Hill Trail. In April 2016, we scheduled a public hearing and the town sent out notices to all property owners within 600 feet of the project area. The meeting was at San Anselmo Town Hall and a good sized crowd attended. Most residents were in favor of the project, but several had concerns. The major objection was that the trail would give easier access to the hill to the homeless, increasing the number of campsites and the risk of crime, fire, and privacy issues. Others feared that visitors would smoke on the summit and start fires. Some people suggested that having a public trail near their homes would decrease their property values. I tried to address these concerns. At my request, both the fire chief and the police chief wrote letters stating that the opening up, that opening up of the wild or less accessible areas of the hill would make it less attractive to the homeless and would actually lessen the danger of crime and fire. I created a poll on next door asking people who lived near existing trailheads if they had problems with privacy, trespassing, vandalism, or other crime. I received more than 50 replies and all but two said that they had never had a problem, they loved the convenient trail access, and felt that the trail had increased their property values. The other two hadn't had any problems, but simply wished the trailheads were a bit further away. Realtors agreed that access to open space was a real selling point and, and was likely to increase property values. I called another community meeting to present these results and all opposition dissolved. We took the proposal back to the town council and in August, 2017, they gave final approval to build both trails. Finally, I could start building the Red Hill Trail. Starting from the top where the old road was in the best condition, I worked my way down the hill, clearing the brush and cutting a rough preliminary trail. I worked on weekends and after work on summer evenings. 
It took two years, but finally it was cut through the whole way. Now that access was easier, I led members of the town council and supervisor Katie Rice up the hill to show them my plans and to drum up assistance. Katie donated $15,000 she had in a special fund for trails. I collaborated with Judy Coy, chair of the San Anselmo Historical Commission to research the history of Red Hill. I learned that it had a rich history. It was formed 150 million years ago in a submarine volcano that extruded pillow lava under the floor of a Jurassic Sea. More recently, it was part of the lands of the Mission San Rafael. When the mission was secularized in 1834, the governor of Alta California ordered the distribution of the former mission lands to the mission's Indians as they had been promised. The man he chose for the job was the six foot seven Irishman, Don Timoteo Murphy, who had built the first house in San Rafael. He climbed to the top of Red Hill and divided all the land he could see into three great ranchos. The land to the west, including the future Western San Anselmo and Fairfax, he had named Rancho Cañada de Herrera, Blacksmith Gulch, and it was given to Domingo Sayas, a former soldier at the mission. To the south of Red Hill, Murphy created the 14 square mile Rancho Punta de Cantin, granted to 49 year old English sea captain, John Rogers Cooper. The lands to the north and east of Red Hill from Nicasio to Point San Pedro and up to Marin Wood was taken by Don Timoteo himself for his services. The Indians got only a small rancho in Nicasio. In the 1870s, when Captain Henry Du Bois founded the Mount Tamalpais Cemetery, he wished to have easier access from San Anselmo. When he was unable to get access across the lands of Sunny Hills, he purchased Red Hill and hired crews of Chinese laborers to build the steep switchback road up the west side and down the north side to the cemetery. The road was used only once when a one horse hearse transported a body to the cemetery. It is said the driver threw down his reins in disgust and said, I'll never drive that damned road again. In 1913, there was a plan to build 26 houses along the old road, but nothing came of it. In 1916, three men drove a Model T Ford up the road, but they had to pick it up to negotiate the switchbacks. In 1934, a 20 foot tall wooden cross was erected at the summit and religious services were held there on Easter Sunday mornings. How they got that organ up there, I have no idea. But after World War II, the road became overgrown and the services were discontinued. A major landslide in January 1967 carried away portions of the old road and destroyed a number of homes and apartments. The historic hilltop was no longer accessible. Judy Coy from the History Museum found several historic photographs taken from Red Hill. I walked the hill carrying these photographs and located the exact spots from which they had been taken. Judy and I prepared the historical information and photographs and working with Public Works, we designed and ordered a set of five signs for the Red Hill Trail. Public Works hired Ted Van Mitty and Sons, concrete contractors, to reinforce the steep cross slope halfway up. They hauled all the materials up the hill on their backs for a 200 foot long fence and retaining wall. This included 35 60 pound sacks of cement and scores of five gallon buckets of water. They did a great job. I organized weekly volunteer work parties and used students from Drake High School to fulfill their community service requirements. They widened and smoothed the trail, installed reinforcing timbers as necessary, and trimmed the poison oak back to a safe distance. We installed an information kiosk, trash and recycling cans, and a doggy pot. When the trail signs were delivered by Davis Sign Company of San Rafael, I installed them. The trail was finally finished. Five years after its conception, we had an official ribbon cutting on April 28, 2018, attended by Open Space Committee members, town council members, and employees, contractors, volunteers, and the public. In June 2017, we organized another public meeting to propose the Memorial Ridge Trail to the neighbors. This time, there was some opposition to the idea. A private dirt road runs from the top of the ridge down to Monterey Terrace. The property owner was concerned that the new trail would increase traffic on his private road. The town agreed to block off both ends of his road with bollards and chains. Finally, all objections had been met. Since we had money left from building the Red Hill Trail, Sean Condry, the director of San Anselmo Public Works, suggested we hire Elite Tree Service, headed by Rich Torreson, to clear the route of the trail through the cemetery. I agreed gratefully. 
And on August 30th, 2018, they started pulling broom and dragging the eucalyptus debris down the hill and hauling it away. It was challenging work on the steep hill and it was impossible to avoid the dense thickets of poison oak. At one point, they broke into a nest of yellow jackets and several of the men were stung repeatedly. But in a few days, they had cleared the entire route through the cemetery. Sean and I were so pleased with our work, we agreed to have them cut the trail and build the stairs. And they put in 40 steps using four foot long lengths of two inch galvanized pipes to nail the steps into the steep hillside. That went so well, we had them do the other steep hillside as well as the final part descending to Memorial Park. In the end, they put in over 100 steps. I was very pleased I didn't have to try to organize volunteer teams to do all that heavy work. Eagle Scout Harrison Campbell installed all the signs. My friends Dro Miller, Don Harper and I cut the trail through the woods and on March 13th, 2019, seven months after starting construction, the work was completed. We invited the neighbors, town officials, and volunteers and had a ribbon cutting for the Memorial Ridge Trail on Saturday, September 14th, 2019. It had been 17 years since I first conceived of the trail. So that's how trails get built in the 21st century not by men in khaki jodhpurs and ladies in knickerbockers, but with environmental studies and town meetings and many people and organizations coming together. But in the end, they're still built by a guy with a mattock and shovel. Before I conclude, I wanted to give you an idea of my personal experience of trail building. I wrote the following way back in 1990 while I was building my first illegal trail in Fode Park and perhaps it will give you an idea of why people still enjoy building trails. I first cut my way through the brush with garden nippers and a handsaw, making an opening large enough to walk through. Then I stand and study the hillside, evaluating the obstacles, choosing the best path. I visualize the trail ahead, seeing it curving away through the trees. Then I get to work. I use a mattock to dig out the tread and cut a sharp uphill edge then a shovel to fill in the downhill edge with the excavated dirt. I use my feet to tramp out a smooth path two feet wide. After 30 minutes of hard work and many slips on a steep leaf covered slope, I can stand on a firm and level trail that only moments before was merely an idea. Only the two tools are required. They are simple, ancient tools and neither job is difficult, but I find that I much prefer the shovel to the mattock. The ground ahead is a carpet of living things. They are small, but each has germinated against overwhelming odds and forced its way up through the leaf litter. They have survived the rabbits and the deer, the caterpillars and the beetles. As I cut them down, I can't help but think of the terrible havoc I am wreaking on this tiny community. Who am I to judge it insignificant merely because of its size? And so there is a certain grimness in my mood as I swing the mattock. Iris bulbs are rooted out and thrown aside. Tiny oak seedlings are chopped down. Worms are hacked in two to lie writhing at my feet. Countless creatures scuttle out of my way, driven from their homes as I move along. Behind me is a trail of destruction of uprooted plants and torn and broken soil. My environmentalist conscience winces with each stroke. After I've gone a few feet though, I take up the shovel with relief. Now it is a creative task. I am building instead of destroying. I take the jumble of broken soil and smooth it into a path, something aesthetic and useful, something people can use with pleasure to enjoy the quiet forest hillside. The mood of the work is completely different. I shovel and tamp, scrape and fill until the path is smooth and wide. A last few touches and it is done. Then I lean on the shovel and admire the new path. I take great satisfaction in standing there and looking back at my new trail meandering off through the trees. The destruction is no longer evident. The flora and fauna I've destroyed lie hidden amongst the leaf litter. The next person to see this section of trail will never miss them. He will notice only the easy trail and the lovely forest on either side. My conscience is a little troubled. I know I have done no real harm to the forest. And yet when I take up the mattock again, I often stop and admire some tiny flower for long moments before I can bring myself to swing the heavy steel down again. It's a pleasant physical and mental exercise, building a path. It allows a great deal of time for musing. It strikes me as a particularly human endeavor, 
taking a complex fractal natural surface and imposing upon it a simple platonic mathematical shape that exists only in my mind. But of course, it is not possible to simply draw out the imagined curve on the ground and then cut it. I will not cut down any trees and the irregularities of the hillside force the path to wander from the ideal. The finished trail is certainly not a natural feature of the woods, but it is also not exactly the way I had imagined it. Its course is the result of thousands of small decisions, each a compromise between my wishes and the needs and realities of the forest and its terrain. And these are compromises in the best sense of the world, not man conquering nature as if such a dichotomy were possible, but man working with nature, finding a solution that allows both hikers and the forest to coexist, meeting the needs of both. As I stand there sweating in the dappled light, admiring my handiwork, it comes to me that building a trail is a metaphor. We all have ideals that do not match the realities of the world around us. We must learn to adjust both, doing what we can not only to change the world to match our hopes, but also modifying our dreams to conform to reality. When done well, when our many compromises are made wisely, the result is both self-evidently correct and aesthetically pleasing, whether it is a trail in the woods or the course of our lives. Thanks for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wow. Thank you, Brian. That is amazing. And amazing to think that so much of the work that preceded actually building the trail was the bulk of years just to get approval to build yeah. the trail. Seems like that was the greatest obstacle of all. It was. Okay, well, now's a great time for questions and we have a few here for you. The first one is from an anonymous person. And the question is, do you know about the Willow Meadow Trail between High Marsh Trail and Kent Trail? No. <laughs> okay, well that one, but I'm interested. Um, I'll keep that and we'll look for that. Is that the one, one that, was, that was closed? There was a trail up the High Marsh that was closed a few years ago. Um, have to see if this person doesn't, doesn't respond to that. Okay, let's go to the next question from Celeste. Actually, um, she is suggesting that the Tourist Club on Mount Tam may be interested in having you speak um, when they open again for uh, gatherings. Uh, can you tell us how you can be available? People can reach you? Yes, you can. Um... I should uh, put up my email address. Um, BrianCrawford.info is my website. If you go there, um, I believe you can contact me through that, or you can um, you can contact Deborah and she can give it to you. Yes, uh, through the Historical Society, you can anybody can send any questions to the Mill Valley Historical Society, and that that your email will be directed to the right channels. Okay. Here's from Nona. Hi, Nona. How do you decide which trails are appropriate to share with mountain bikes and which are not? Do bikes change the trail experience? That's a very touchy issue. And it's been a long ongoing uh, discussion in the county. I have uh, quite a number of friends that are mountain bikers. Uh, a good friend that helped me build much of the trail is an avid mountain biker, and we had a lot of discussions about it. Um, whatever answer I give is going to uh, stir up debate. Uh, there is certainly room on the, on the hills for both. Um, there are trails that I believe are either too narrow um, or um, too steep to be uh, safe for bikes. So I certainly think that there need to be many areas that are not, um, that where bicycles are not allowed. As to which ones, um, I don't make those decisions. Um, the county does for the, all the county open space, the, you know, the various authorities for each park and they're all making those decisions and struggling with them. Bikes are not allowed on my trails because they both have many steps and they're um, only two feet wide. There's not enough room for uh, bikes to pass. And it, uh, we've seen a few bikes on it, but it hasn't been a problem yet. 
Okay, this is from Eva. How long is Fod Park and where does it begin? Also Memorial Ridge Trail. Um, Fode Park is, um, uh, actually the San Anselmo Open Space Committee has a website that shows all of the open space preserves in San Anselmo. It's um, just off Oakland Avenue and um, Alderney is one of the entrances to it. Um, it's, it's 16 acres, so it's a fairly small park, but I, many people I know have grown up in San Anselmo don't even know it's here, which is fine with me because it's right next to my house, but it is a lovely park with beautiful views. Um, and uh, I'm pulling broom up there uh, every day or two. So um, if anyone wants to pull broom, I can always use more volunteers. Um, the Memorial Ridge Trail um, starts at the uh, American Legion log cabin in Memorial Park, just to the right of the, as you face the log cabin, just to the right there, there's some batting cages and there's a trailhead there. It's pretty well marked. And uh, once you're on it, it's uh, pretty hard to get lost. It goes up to the top of the ridge and then through Mount Tamalpais Cemetery and then hits the Sorich Trail into Sorich Ranch Park. And then you can come back on um, Los Angeles Boulevard, it makes a nice loop walk. The Red Hill Trail starts um, right next to Red Hill Shopping Center, the behind, um, behind Safeway. You can park there and, and walk right up from there. And that's just a, a, an up and back, there's no, uh, loop option there. Thank you. Uh, this is from Lynn. Brian, what's next? Any new projects that you're contemplating? Uh, no. Um, I'm getting a little long in the tooth here. I'm finding it pulling broom is about all I can manage and even that's pretty tough. So I, uh, um, there have been discussions of other trails um, they all get complicated because it immediately gets into a conflict with should it be biking or hiking or both. Um, so I probably won't be building any more new trails. Um, I go out every few days and, and pick up litter and pull a little broom to try to keep these trails nice. Um, but yeah, I think I'm a little old for that now. Okay. Uh, here's just a comment from Charisma. Thank you for all your hard work. Much appreciated. Love the trails. Here's a question from Marilyn. Is there an online map, a link where we can see all the trails you've been a big part of creating? Thank you for an excellent presentation. Oh, great. Um, the, the San Anselmo Open Space Committee is rebuilding their website now, even as I speak. Um, it, it does show the sites of the parks, um, but the, uh, the updated one will show the new trails. Um, so uh, yes, it, it, it's available on the San Anselmo Open Space Committee website, if you just Google that. Okay, um, here's another anonymous question. How did the efforts of the CCC of FDR in the 1930s key into the trail building that you described? They did a lot of the trail work on the mountain. Uh, the, the big accomplishment, of course, was the mountain theater, um, but they built many of the other trails. They also did work on um, some of the springs that they you know, cleaned out and maintained them and, and put uh, rock around them. Um, they had a big camp down near Alpine there where Alpine Lake is and um, um, operated, I, I think for quite a while, for some years. Uh, doing work all over the, the mountain. Okay. Um, here is a comment, just a comment that Mark wants to say. We have had no issues from the homeless population since Crawford's Red Hill Trail, which was not only problematic beforehand, beforehand but dangerous as, dangerous as one can see from the fire that we endured in 2016. We are a mere 400 feet, plus or minus, from Red Hill Summit, the way the crow flies. I climb San Anselmo's newest trail by Brian once a week, and I try to remember to pick up after all those who leave behind things they shouldn't. Yep. Thank you. Thank Red Hill Trail is amazing. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And Mark, a.k.a. Geojammers. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thanks for the love, Mark. Okay, Marilyn, I used to climb the Hogback Trail. Can you tell me what the status of it is now? 
Um, the last I heard, it was still closed. I think it's, I assume that it's closed because it's so steep and it's an erosion problem. It has a, a gully running down it. So I, I would guess that it's a permanent closure unless the, um, they're planning on rebuilding it. Okay, thank you for that. Jeff asks, what is the history on the steep ravine trail? Uh, that's not one I researched actually. Um, so I don't know that. It, it, it's quite old, I know. Um, I see references to it from um, very early in the 20th century. I don't know how, how far back it goes, but it's got that great ladder that everybody always remembers, especially the bikers. <laughs> I've never seen a biker on steep ravine, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I hope never to. <laughs> okay, this is from Josh. In your research about historical trail development, was there anything other than personal, personal initiative driving new building? Um, you mean it was like profit? Um, I, don't, I don't really know. I think it was just people that loved the mountain and wanted to access it and show it to other people. It's kind of my motive for uh, my trails anyway. Okay, I'm just gonna read one comment here that I think we can, there's no more questions, so we can move on, uh, but I do wanna close. Um, well, I have, I have a question first and then I'm gonna read this comment. First question, my question to you is, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanna mention before we close your, your discussion? No, not really. I, thank you for suggesting it. It was a, it was a great idea. I, uh, it took me a lot longer than I expected. And of course, I think the pandemic came through in there in the middle of all that. But um, it was an interesting project. I, I got into a lot of materials and met a lot of people doing the research that was that was fun. Um, and yeah, it's kind of it's fun sharing the trails. One of my thoughts in, when I first put this together was, wow, all the pictures are of me. This looks like it's all about me. And, um, you know, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, you know, I did build the trails, but um, it, it was for the people of Marin County, you know, so that people could enjoy these places that I had gotten to and they weren't able to get to. So now they can, and it's always a pleasure to, I can, <clears throat> that. The Crawford Trail is just a 50 yards or so from my house. So I hear voices of families walking through the woods, you know, right from my house. And um, I can look across the ridge and see people walking along the top of Memorial Ridge Trail. And um, every time I drive down past the hub there, I see people walking on the Red Hill Trail. And that's really a pleasure to know that people are enjoying my trails and hopefully will be for a long time. Yes, I agree. Very satisfying. Uh, Here's a comment by my friend, Abby, um, friend of the Historical Society. She says, thank you for your wonderful talk, Brian. You are as beautiful a writer as you are a skilled trail builder. Oh. <laughs> and I concur. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who enjoyed tonight's talk, I urge you to go to Brian's website. And that website address again is? Uh, BrianCrawford.info. Because if you like this talk, you're going to love his books, seriously. So, um, and we will certainly have him as a guest again. Also, this is recorded. So this recording will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website in the uh, First Wednesday Speaker Series uh, page that's in the events. So you can watch it again, take notes again, and share with friends if you like. And now I don't think there's anything else. Many comments, Brian, saying fantastic thought, uh, talk. Um, yes, I'd, I have a couple of comments of my own. Before we close, I'd like to give a shout out to the Friends of Mount Tam and the West Point Inn, the Tamil Pius Conversa Conservation Club, and the various hiking groups on Mount Tam. We love you. And it's been a rough couple of years and to the audience, these groups need our support. So I hope you and the audience will share the love and show how much you appreciate the commitment that these groups give to our beautiful Mount Tam. Additionally, I'd like to say a special thanks to Dewey Livingston, Fred Runner and Barry Spitz 
who in the 11th hour helped us include Norris and Bob Stanton in this talk. I really, really wanted to have a woman trail builder included. And so I'm very glad we were able to do so with such a lovely image as well. And then lastly, the His Mill Valley Historical Society is very pleased to have published Adventures of Two Me Walk Children by my dear friend and fellow board member, Betty Girk. And this beautiful book is, hang on one second. Oh, this beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily lives of a real boy and girl who live in the neighboring villages of San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in this story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. To order directly, please visit the Mill Valley Historical Society website. And I hope you all will join us next month. That's October 6, 2021. Our guest speakers will be historians Dewey, Louis, Dewey Livingston and Richard Turney, and they'll be talking about landscape transformation in the Corte Madera wetlands which is very interesting. And they'll be including the Green Beret Boardwalk, that wonderfully interesting place that is so alluring, but most of us don't know much about it. Well, that's our evening, Brian. Again, I wanna say thank you, thank you for creating this beautiful talk, which turned out to be so much more work than you originally anticipated when we first discussed it. I look forward to hiking with you again in the future. Uh, Natalie, thank you very, very much for all your help as always. And to you and the audience, thanks for your interest. Thanks for, for caring and be well. We'll see you next month. That's it. Good night. <laughs>